It's The Real News Network, and I'm Greg Wilpert in Baltimore. In presenting the economic part of President Trump's so-called deal of the century to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, White House advisor Jared Kushner presented a sterilized vision of the Palestinian economy in which there is no Israeli occupation and no widespread destruction of aid projects by Israeli forces. In the end, the plan gives the impression that only the Palestinians are to be blamed for the economic troubles. Here at The Real News, we recently interviewed Ali Abu Nima about the recent summit in Bahrain in which Kushner presented the economic portion of the peace plan, but we did not address some of the outright falsehoods that Kushner uttered in presenting the deal. Here is an example. In recent years, instead of building on a history of innovation and entrepreneurship, the Palestinians became the highest per capita donor aid recipients in the world with no plan and no end in sight. I might be in the minority, but I believe that this can change. Prosperity is not something that is given to people. Prosperity is something that is earned with smart planning, determination, and fortitude. The Palestinian people have these qualities, intelligence, strength, perseverance, courage, and great supply. Let's harness these strengths and create the opportunity for them to succeed. In fact, it's not the Palestinians, but rather the Israelis who are the recipients of the largest amount of per capita aid in the world since 1973. Most of this aid is military aid from the United States. But this is not to say that billions of dollars in aid haven't been invested in, Palesti in the Palestinian economy and to support the establishment of a Palestinian state, especially since 1994. This begs the question, however, why then has the Palestinian economy stagnated over the past 25 years? Where has all the money gone? In essence, this is a question about aid effectiveness. The policy analyst Jeremy Wildman recently wrote a book presenting research on the issue titled Donor Aid Effectiveness and Do No Harm in the Occupied Palestinian Territories. Jeremy now joins us to discuss his research. He is a research fellow at the University of Bath specializing in Palestinian development and Western relations with the region. Thanks for joining us today, Jeremy. Uh, thanks for having me, Greg. So let's start with the Bahrain summit. Kushner did not offer any explanation as to what happened to all the billions that were already invested in the Palestinian uh, economy and in infrastructure, job creation, industry, and transportation hubs. Can you tell us why this aid has not been effective so far? Also, uh, do you think that there is anything in the so-called deal of the century that would avoid the mistakes of the past? No, the deal of the century is consistent with everything that's happened in the past, and it's just an extension. But what it does is react to new realities on the ground, which is effectively the annexation or probable annexation of the West Bank and East Jerusalem uh, in a formal way to, to Israel. So it's really an updating of the same processes and the same plans that have been underway since the, almost the 19, from the US side from the 1970s, overall from the international community since 1993, since the Oslo process got underway. And this, entire aid models based on the idea that you can ignore the context of the conflict and somehow stimulate Palestinian economic growth and the development of institutions, and then that this will lay the foundations for peace. But it's not possible. I mean, you can't actually undertake development in what is at best a conflict situation without addressing the politics first. So in your research, you focused on analyzing the perspectives of donors and of development agencies, and you used a text analysis of oral and written reports. Give us some examples of what those perspectives are in organizations such as the World Bank, which uh, manages so much of the aid to Palestine, and how do such perspectives affect the ability to build su successful projects? Uh, yeah, first I'll mention, Greg, it's not a, a book, it's just book-sized. It's in a study of nine of the donors, and it, it is... 200 pages long, so it looks like the book. But there, there's sort of a clustering of, 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 of approaches that uh, that I found. And it's really important to mention too here that those texts, the texts I looked at are, are, are very political by nature. And this in a way reflects the politics of those organizations. And it doesn't necessarily reflect what the, the actual people working on these know, and in many cases, they pro might not agree with their own text. And this came up with the interviews with policymakers. Now, roughly, you could say that Canada, the US and IMF completely ignore the context of Israel's occupation. In fact, you can read through the, the, the their main 
documentation, then you might forget that that's an issue at all. So that's reflected in what you hear from Kushner. The World Bank, you have that issue, particularly from 2012 onward. Um, they do have at times better analysis, recognition at least that settlements are a problem. And you see that as well from the UK. Uh, with the Europeans, there is recognition that human rights are a core issue and the Israeli rule and the occupation and the settlement building are undermining Palestinian statehood. One problem with the EU is even if they say this outright, it doesn't mean it affects their overall policy. It doesn't mean that they challenge Israeli rule or that they will challenge the United States' approach. Now, one of the aspects of your research is to compare between different actors on the world stage towards Palestinians, as you already mentioned. Now, yeah. the European Union has a different approach from the US, as you say. Um, for example, and you mentioned in a recent interview with TRT that the deal of the century, um, the European Union is taking a step back and is not offering any funding for this project, while the U.S. is instead counting on Gulf states to be the main funders. Now, considering the different perspectives of the EU and the Gulf states, how do you think this will affect the form that uh, aid will take uh, towards Palestinians? Yeah, it's really interesting. Like, we don't know for sure how the EU will land on this. Um, in the end, the EU, EU usually goes with what the United States wants in the Middle East. Uh, there is there's a lack of comfort necessarily now with, with how the U.S. has been operating in the region in the last decade. But it could be that in the end, the EU will follow the U.S. For now, from what we've seen, it appears as if the EU would be a minority donor or they might just keep funding projects as they've been funding since 1993. So investing in education, in institutions, in, 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 the, in the things that Palestinians need for their daily life so that their society can, does not collapse. Um, but the Gulf taking over, it's a much different type of donor. They're going to be playing more of a real politics. So they want the Palestinian territories to be in a good enough situation that, that it's, there's some quiet there, that we don't necessarily see another intifada. And one of the reasons is that they are looking at a larger confrontation with Iran. And in that case, the U.S. and Israel in some way are their ally. So, but uh, what kind of, um, what difference does that make concretely on the ground for the form that the aid takes? Yeah, the, uh, the Gulf donors, I mean, we're not, can't be quite sure yet, but they would be more interested in funding the Palestinian Authority itself and the security services perhaps. And this is something you've been seeing with since the second intifada, where security is getting much more funding, and the Palestinians are being pushed into security coordination with Israel, which relieves Israel the need of patrolling the areas A, so let's say the main Palestinian population centers. The Europeans, so this is this is quite different from the Europeans, who really they they do commit themselves to the original aim of Oslo, of building democratic, liberal institutions, and to stimulating growth through free trade. Now, finally, what are the Israeli perspectives uh, towards international aid? Do Israeli authorities have a preference for certain types of aid that they would like to see uh, being dispersed, dispersed to Palestinians and by whom? And what has the Israeli government's reaction been to the deal of the century? Well, the deal of the century is, is quite a deal for them, right? I mean, some of their closest allies in the U.S., in, the, in this very close U.S. administration have developed it. So they should be pretty happy with how the process has moved along. It, historically, the U.S. has reinforced the two-state solution as a way to moderate its alliance with Israel and its other regional allies. Now, as far as, as aid is concerned, largely you could say that the Israeli government has welcomed it. Uh, it has offset many costs for Israel. Normally, especially when we're talking 50 years, an occupying power should be covering the costs of administration of a occupied people, if not give, granting them outright citizenship. In this case, international donors have stepped in, in particular, since 1993 to cover those costs. Now, there's an internal debate you can see, and I think another real news uh, expert, Shir Haver, will know a bit more on this. But from what I understand, and, and Shir has sort of influenced my own uh, perspective on this is that it's a bit of an internal Israeli debate where the the more liberal and the military camp will welcome that aid to support Palestinian institutions but the more right-wing let's say Likud style politicians will prefer funding for security coordination okay 
Well, we're going to leave it there for now. I'm speaking to Jeremy Wildman, Research Fellow at the University of Bath. Thanks again, Jeremy, for having joined us today. You're welcome, Greg. And thank you for joining the Real News Network.